WWDC 2022 was jam-packed, and now that the dust has settled, let's have a look at some of the highlights as well as what we expected and what we didn't quite get. We'll look at the highlights from iOS, Home, WatchOS, Mac, macOS, iPad, and more. And this video is sponsored by Aura. Want the latest Apple news, leaks, and rumors? Subscribe and ring the bell. First up, iOS 16 is bringing a huge amount of customization to the lock screen, including new lock screen widgets, but let's call this what it really is, Apple Watch faces on your phone. From the way they're switched with a long press to switch between different layouts and the portrait images that partially cover the clock, to the complications that you can add what we basically have is watchOS. Sadly, it looks like most of the clock fonts available are ugly. I would happily have taken the iOS 7 style Helvetica new ultralight all day long, but these are all a little bit chunky and ugly to me. But at least if Apple wants to fix it, it's easy. Those can also be switched automatically with different focus modes too, just like on the watch. So you can have a different screen on your home screen for work, driving, don't use your phone when you're driving. That's just a bad choice in the first place. Messages got a bunch of upgrades too, with the highlights being the ability to edit and even unsend messages. Now, I can only assume that this will only work with iMessage, not when you message one of the Android peasants with their dirty green bubbles. Live text from video is also a pretty amazing feature, so you can now pause the video and copy text right from the screen, just as you did with photos last year. And the main feature that nearly made me fall off my chair, grabbing a picture of a dog out of the background and dropping it into a basically clear PNG in a message. Now, when you touch and hold on the subject of an image, you can lift it away from the background and place it in apps like Messages. It feels like magic. That just blew my mind and I'm now going to make all of my thumbnails in messages from now on. Apple managed to spend well over 40 minutes on iOS 16 and there are a bunch of other great features too which we'll get to in more detail when the public betas arrive next month. I'm not putting the developer one on my main iPhone that we're filming on now. That will just lead to disaster. Also, something about sports or Apple News or... I'm, I assume that someone cares about sports but it seemed like a waste of time for me. On to home. And Apple talked a lot about the matter stuff coming to HomeKit, but never really mentioned Apple hardware, TV or HomePod. So I'm wondering now whether they both have new hardware coming in the fall, which might bring interesting new features then. Watch this space. The new version of CarPlay, however, looks insanely cool and actually adds a bunch of custom colorways when it takes over your dash and all of the other screens in your car, basically replacing everything that your car maker barely bothered to make in the first place. Anyway, let's be honest, no cars have good uh, in-car entertainment or computer systems. They are all terrible, except Tesla, and they're the only ones that probably won't support this because Elon's a bit weird like that. But as this new version of CarPlay won't support any current cars or cars launched until at least later this year, from the sounds of things, there's probably not that much to talk about just yet, but it does look insanely cool. WatchOS brought new watch face layouts, which will match up pretty well with the new iPhone ones. The Metropolitan looks really nice, though. Uh, more complications are being added to a bunch of the other faces with the rich complications, so you can see data without having to click into it. And notifications are being reimagined to not take over the whole display every single time you get an alert. Apple Watch fitness tracking gets way more granular with form tracking for running being added and even power tracking so that you can track progress over time. Sleep tracking also gets way more detail and seems to be taking Apple Watch from basically the worst sleep tracker in the world to one of the best overnight. Get it? Overnight. Sleep. Whatever. Then we got to the Max M2. M2 was finally announced with a larger die if second generation 5 nanometer process, but it's based, as we expected, on the A15 technology with over 20 billion transistors inside. Memory bandwidth is up 50% to 100 gigabytes per second, and you get a maximum of 24 gigs of memory supported now instead of 16. Now, I thought that meant that we were going to get 12 and 24 gig options, but actually we're going 8, 16, 24. Annoying. I would have liked... 12 would have been great. 12 would have been perfect, Apple, but you took it away from me. The chip itself is 8 cores, 4 performance and 4 efficiency, exactly as we expected, with performance up a respectable 18%. And when compared to an Intel Core i7-1255U which is a thing, it uses about a quarter of the power to deliver the same performance. That's not bad at all. The GPU is up to 10 cores, which gives 35% better performance than the M1 and blows away Intel's integrated graphics chips. There's also media engines for 8K H.264 files and ProRes, with the M2 now able to play a pair of 8K ProRes streams together, or presumably, therefore, 
eight 4K streams, which would be the same amount of data because it's four. Yeah, that makes sense. And of course, they put it in the new MacBook Air and Pro. And I think they might have picked the Air name at the last minute, but more on that in a few. So the new MacBook Pro 13 inch with M2 is exactly that. We can move on from this because it's exactly what we had before, but it's got M2 in it instead of M1. Done. The Air, however, gets a bigger liquid retina display, but not XDI. It's not mini LED, just be aware of that. It's 20% smaller overall, but has a slightly larger footprint. It has new colours, of course, Starlight, which is what I expected when we heard it was going to be more of a champagne gold, uh, Silver, Space Grey, and Midnight, which is the blue that we'd heard about. And I think that's pretty good. However, we've already seen, even in, I think, Apple's demos, there's some little bits of that that seem to be wearing off around the edges. We're going to have the same issues that we had with the uh, iPhone 5 because it's got sharp edges and a dark colour, which is really going to show the silver through when it scratches. Buyer beware. Now, could we get a mid-release purple on this like we do with iPhones? Who knows? Probably not, though. The displays are up to a billion colours. We got the notch and we got black bezels and black keyboards. We even got a 1080p camera but without centre stage, and if you want that, you need to stick your iPhone on the back of it, but we'll come to that as well later. You also get spatial audio and MagSafe charging, and honestly, it looks pretty great. Video editing is apparently 38% faster than on the M1, so that seems like a pretty good win for me too. The base model gets a binned 8-core GPU, 8 gigs of unified memory, and 256 gigs of storage, basically the same as before, um, and it's $100 extra if you want to go up to the 10-core GPU version, and $200 to bump up the memory or the storage to the next notch. And on to why I think the name was a little bit of a last minute dot com. I think they were going to call this MacBook um, because they didn't bother putting MacBook Air onto the bottom of it like they did with the MacBook Pro. And if they wanted to, they could have like laser etched it on there if it's just that the metal's too thin. But I think this was going to be called MacBook and then they were keeping the MacBook Air as that entry level M1, which is what Guo Chi had told us about, and I think this was going to be the mid-range at $11.99, but uh, looks like it's MacBook Air. Don't really like the new branding, though. I think the new logo looks a bit daft. And on to macOS Mammoth. Wait, no, macOS Ace Ventura. Uh, we get camera continuity, which, as I suggested before, the last WWDC means you can now slap your iPhone onto the back of it and use it seamlessly as a webcam for your Mac. Now, not only does this mean using the much better main camera on your phone, but the Mac can also use the ultra-wide and some computational magic to basically give you a top-down view of your desk at the same time as using the ultra wide to capture your face in the center stage slightly um, there was also stage manager and i think it's interesting but i think it's probably more important for the ipad than for the mac but having the option of having the consistency so that when you do come back to your mac and you can use it the same way as your ipad if that's what you're doing is probably a useful thing now i'm personally happy with the way that spaces works but it's a nice innovation and i'm just hoping they haven't taken spaces away from me pass keys is another huge upgrade probably another one that won't be fully rolled out right away but it replaces passwords completely and apple has worked with the fido alliance which is basically a future beyond passwords so that you can use your iPhone to authenticate yourself on devices when they don't have biometrics. It seems to be basically using a QR code on the screen that you scan and then your iPhone knows who to send the biometric yes please to and then you do it on your phone and it then knows that you're there. So seems cool. No more password leaks after this happens, apparently. Then we get on to gaming. So Metal 3 brings Apple's own version of upscaling to uh, so that performance can be improved on the Macs. And Apple has also worked with the team at Resident Evil The Village and No Man's Sky to bring these to Apple Silicon natively. There was no uh, there was no talk of hardware, though. I feel like that might be the sort of stuff that comes out when this becomes consumery uh, in September, October time. I feel like we might actually see Apple gaming peripherals to use with the devices we have. Still don't think we will get specific gaming hardware, though, like a gaming Mac or a gaming handheld doesn't make any sense and I don't think they'll do that with Apple TV either but we could be wrong as I said earlier we might be getting some new hardware and then on to iPad OS 16 bringing pretty much everything from iOS apart from I think the lock screens and even a weather app seriously how long did that take that is far too long there's also some work collaboration stuff on iWork documents over FaceTime which is pretty cool especially for the remote working paradigm that Apple and Elon Musk both really hate and on the topic of Elon Musk on the second time that he's come up in this show so far, our next 
Apple What If will be what if Elon was Apple CEO, so don't forget to subscribe if you already haven't. Files got a couple more new features, but not like the big stuff that we wanted, like being able to format drives, but being able to see what extension a file has and how big it is. Pro level stuff. <laughs> Reference mode also comes to the XDR iPad so that you can have more consistency across devices. Also, there was something about Windows on an M1 iPad of some sort that you can resize. I don't think anyone really cared, but this was one of the big ones. Uh, you can now display scale on M1 iPad so you can have more screen real estate Bit more stuff on there so that you can use it in a more pro way. Swap files come to the M1 iPads too, so individual apps can now have up to 16 gigs of memory, and it also allows you to use Stage Manager from the Mac with those resizable windows, which I know everyone cared about, I don't. Um, <laughs> I wish I cared about this bit more than I do. However, they did actually add external display support as well when you're using a Magic Trackpad and keyboard, which is pretty good. We will dive more into the new stuff that is coming in the next few weeks, uh, but let me know what is your favourite feature and let me know in the comments any questions that you have because the next video will be answering your WWDC questions, so do your iCave answers down there too. And now, a word from our sponsor, Aura. Do you know what the fastest growing crime in America is? For years, the crime rate has been surging and affecting millions of Americans. I'm talking about identity theft, and there's a new victim every 14 seconds. Yet despite this, those who have their identity stolen are often shocked when it happens. Imagine trying to log into your email account only to see that your password has changed hours ago, then you start getting notifications of activity from your bank, credit cards, crypto accounts. That's when the feelings of panic, fear, anxiety, paranoia, disbelief, shock, anger, and frustration and guilt set in. That's why I'm excited to partner with Aura, who is sponsoring this video. Aura is an identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, and a VPN, password management software, and antivirus software combined into one easy-to-use app. Aura monitors the dark web for your emails, passwords, and social security numbers, and sends you alerts fast, right to your phone and email. When it comes to fraud, every second matters. Connect your credit cards and bank to be notified of any changes up to four times faster than Aura's competitors. Their VPN allows you to stay anonymous online by keeping your browsing history and personal Personal information safe and encrypted, and their antivirus software that will block malware and viruses before they infect your devices. Sadly for me, Aura is currently only available in the US, but if you check out their free trial, be sure to let me know in the comments how many times your information has been detected on the dark web. Protect you and your family from America's fastest growing crime. Try Aura free for two weeks and see if any of your family's personal information has already been compromised. Start your free trial at aura.com forward slash iCaveDave. Thank you to Aura for sponsoring the show. Thank you so much for watching, thanks to the Patreons, and we will see you in the next one.